It is Friday, October 1st, 2021. Big, big college football weekend. We got six games we're going to break down here. Welcome to Minnesota Sports. My name is Zach Smith, former college football coach at The Ohio State University, the University of Florida, Marshall Temple, and a couple other places. Thank you for tuning in. Well, I'm going to give you the best analysis in college football media right now on the top six games for this weekend. But before we get there, we got a little promotion going, a little sweepstakes, if you may. Down, in the, down below in the pinned comment, I'm putting the six games we're going to break down. Actually, one of them we're not going to break down, but one, either way, six games to pick down below. You pick those six games, the spreads. We're going to take all the winners, pick a winner, and send $100. Win $100 if you can pick all six games. Cost you nothing. All you got to do is comment on this video down below. While you're here, go ahead and hit subscribe. Hit like. We just passed 5,000 uh, subscribers. Trying to get to 10,000 by the end of college football season. If we get there, we're doing a massive giveaway. So hit like, hit subscribe, plenty of more sweepstakes coming, plenty more contests, and plenty, plenty of more great content. So hit subscribe, hit like, thank you for tuning in, let's get to the show. Alright, first game on our docket is Iowa, Maryland tonight, right? And if you're seeing this video on Saturday, I'm gonna the alternative game is going to be Ohio State Rutgers to pick. But if you're seeing this on Friday, pick that game, Iowa minus three and a half at Maryland. Here's, here's my opinion. Iowa's a front runner. They're a front runner team that has a solid defense and a, a very below average offense, right? They're number one in yards per play in the Big Ten, third in the country. They're leading the Big Ten with six interceptions. So their pass defense has been disruptive, right? They have 36 missed tackles on the year, around nine per game. If you don't watch this show, as a, college football coaches are, are insane about missed tackles. If you have single-digit missed tackles in a game, you're probably going to win that game. So Iowa's averaging nine a game, flirting with double digits, right? But here's the issue. They have not seen a quarterback like Tualia Tungavailoa. They haven't seen one like him. 85% adjusted completion percentage, 90% adjusted completion percentage when he's blitzed, which anytime a quarterback has a higher completion percentage versus blitz than base coverage, watch out. That's the markings of a potentially great quarterback. The kid doesn't turn the ball over 10 touchdowns to one interception, right? The only issue Maryland has is they're a little drop happy. The receivers and offensive skill drop the ball a little too much, right? Iowa has a great run defense on paper, analytically, statistically. But when you look at some of their games, like Iowa State, for instance, the only the only team that's maybe comparable to Maryland, I'd say Maryland and Iowa State are similar teams. Iowa State ran it decent on them, over three yards a carry, and Maryland hasn't been horrible at running the ball. The issue with this team is certainly their offense, right? Running the ball, Iowa State, 1.7 yards per carry. Colorado State, 1.7 yards per carry. Maryland has a solid rush defense. I think they are fifth in the Big Ten, so nothing outstanding, but they're not a bad rush defense. They're the second-best pass defense. They're very similar to Iowa, right? They're a single-digit missed tackle defense. They're not as dominant in the run game, obviously, but they're a solid defense. Iowa's awful on third down. Maryland's above average on third down. The formula is simple in this game. Iowa has a rusty, uh, a nasty rush defense and a solid pass defense. Maryland will be able to move the ball enough, and is Iowa's offense going to be anything close to competent? That's the real question here. So I think Maryland gets the upset at home as a Friday night lights home dog upset. That's my opinion. Moving on to Boston College offense, or Boston College versus Clemson. Jeff Halfley looking to get revenge from the two-year-old loss to Clemson when he was the defensive coordinator at Ohio State. In, in my opinion, Boston College is a more well-rounded football team, right? We start with DJ Uyunglele, who struggled all year. And the reality is this. NFL scouts talked about it, have, have talked about it kind of anonymously, but Trevor Lawrence was not helped with the scheme that Clemson runs under Tony Elliott at all. There wasn't great game plans. It was honestly kind of very basic offense, and they just were dealing with one of the best quarterbacks in the last decade. And because of that, it was very functional. You look at two years ago when they beat Ohio State, huge game. Their offense was dysfunctional. Trevor Lawrence beat Ohio State with his feet, right? Trevor Lawrence is no longer at Clemson. DJ Ogunlele is not the same caliber player. And honestly, right now, I think Clemson fans would rather have the, the Trevor Lawrence lookalike, the girl from TikTok, as their quarterback just to feel the, some nostalgia of the times when the offense was elite. You look at it, and I mean, they're just they're just average across the board, and Boston College is a solid team. Venable's defense usually is dominant. They're average on third down this year. When they The only time they bow up is in the red zone. They only allow 25% touchdowns uh, when teams get down there. So that's a strength versus strength because BC is really good in the red zone and on offense in general. Now, Clemson's offense is DJ Uyunglele offense. Boy, 
10th in the ACC in rushing. Travis Etienne is not there anymore. Yikes. Dead last in throwing it, 57% completion percentage. Four touchdowns to four interceptions. They're average in the red zone on third down. This team is not what you're used to out of Dabo Sweeney. So I look for Boston College to play it close. And I don't know about pulling upset, but they're certainly certainly going to cover the spread. So take BC Moneyline if you're, if you're really feeling frisky or take them whatever it is, plus 14. It's down in the comments. So drop that comment. Make sure you predict your games down below. All right, we're going to skip Ohio State Rutgers, but if you, but that's going to be your alternative if you miss this on Friday. Pick OSU Rutgers as a spread game. The next game is Notre Dame-Cincinnati. Spoiler alert here. Coming off of a bye week, and you don't know how critical a bye week is for a college football team, especially a well-coached team like Luke Fickle has these Bearcats uh, program run it, running it. Uh, they, coming off a of bye week, I'm going to tell you right now, Cincinnati's going to win this fucking game. They are. They're going to win this game. Desmond Ritter's talking shit already. It shouldn't be too loud for too long in Notre Dame Stadium. This this is a very interesting matchup because both de- both defenses are really good. Both offenses, the, the difference is going to be in the offense, right? Desmond Ritter and the Cincinnati offense is much better than the Notre Dame offense. I mean, Notre Dame's offense is putrid, disgusting. You name a word, it's terrible. Brian Kelly deserves to be bent over and spanked for what he's doing on offense. They've had the best offensive line in college football. They all left. This offensive line is playing horrid for the Golden Domers. They're 128th in the country rushing the ball at 2.3 yards per carry, which means they're just a little bit better than UL Monroe and Bowling Green. They're pushing hard to catch Middle Tennessee. Wisconsin... They averaged three yards, or they had three yards, not per carry, total three yards, 0.09 yards per carry on design runs. Unbelievable. They're about middle in the country throwing the ball. This is just not a solid f- offense. It's just not. And I, I honestly think Cincinnati's defense is going to have their way with it. Jack Cohn is, is, is played decent. He played really well against Florida State, struggled a little bit in some of the later games. 28% on deep balls. The one thing they have done is launched it downfield 20, 25 times. That is absurdly high for an offense. So they're not afraid to take shots. He just doesn't complete them. 41% of his passes over 10 yards are complete. And here's the deal with with Jack Combe. The difference between being blitzed and being pressured, right? When you're blitzed, the other team blitzes, but you pick it up, right? Then you're protected. When you're pressured, you are under pressure. You have to move in the pocket. You have to scramble. When Jack Cohn is blitzed and on any down... He completes the ball 65% of the time as opposed to 59% non-blitzed. So it actually goes up because they protect him, less guys in coverage. It's that He has done well when he's blitzed, but when he's pressured, which we talked about the O-line, it's not a great O-line. When he's pressured, he drops from 67% with no pressure down to 40% when pressured. So the key is this. Can Cincinnati apply pressure, whether it's a four-man rush, a blitz, a twist, doesn't matter. Can they pressure him and make his production drop. That's just the reality. The right side of the offensive line in Notre Dame is is horrid. So watch that right side. 22 pressures between Josh Lugg and Kane Madden, the right guard and right tackle. Five sacks. I mean, they are bad. The former third stringer left tackle, Tosh Baker, hasn't been much better. The reality is this Notre Dame offensive line is the Achilles heel. It really is. You want to win this game if you're Cincinnati? Blitz Jack Cohn and get home. You can't blitz him and have it be picked up or else you're in trouble. You got to blitz him. You got to get, get get home. The menace to sports analytic of the game here, five touchdown attempts out of ele- five touchdowns out of 11 attempts when Cincinnati's on defense, when teams enter the red zone, right? That's not the stat though. Here's the stat. Zero field goals. That means six times opponents didn't score a touchdown and they either got knocked out of field goal range or missed the field goal because when they get in the red zone, Cincinnati unleashes the dogs. They attack, they sick them and they knock them out of field goal range or keep them in a long field goal attempt. That's, that's, that's absurd. It's really, really dynamic. Cincinnati's offense is really good. I like Desmond Ritter 12th in the NCAA on deep balls, about 50% over throws over 10 yards. When he's under pressure, he struggles, but can can Notre Dame get after their ass? That's the question, right? The left tackle, John Williams, for Cincinnati has really been below average in pass pro all year, and I really like uh, Notre Dame's uh, defense alignment with uh, Myron Tungavailoa uh, Amosu. I think he's a really, really good pass rusher. If they can get that matchup, I like uh, I like the chance of Notre Dame putting pressure on him. All in all, I, I don't. it's not an upset because of the spread, but it'll be a huge game for Luke Fickle and the Cincinnati uh program they win this game they got a smooth ride to a potential 
you know, group of five playoff berths. So I'm taking Cincinnati to win this game under the shadow of the Golden Dome. That's my prediction. All right, moving on. We got two SEC games of the week, Arkansas, Georgia, and everyone's looking at this spread, 18 and a half. How is Arkansas dogs, 18 and a half at Georgia? The reality is this, Georgia's offense has so much potential if they can get some guys back from injury. Right now, Kiaris Jackson's out, their top receiver from last year. George Pickens out, their second receiver, for, best receiver from last year. Dominic Blaylock missed all of last year, still hasn't come back. Arian Smith played early this year, isn't playing anymore. They're left with right now, Jermaine Burton is their single stud in the receiver game. Brock Bowers is the, their leading receiver, their tight end. And they're getting back this week, Darnell Washington, their other tight end, who was a starter last year. So that should help their run game, getting in some two tight end sets, and it adds an offensive weapon for whoever the quarterback is. If JT Daniels can come back from that lat injury, it sounds like he probably will play. But um, it's going to be interesting to see how this offense does because the run game's been okay with Zamir White and James Cook, Dalvin Cook's uh, little brother. It's been okay. What they have been able to do is protect the quarterback, whoever the quarterback's been. Arkansas's defense really is the Achilles heel in this in this in this game, right? They average over 10 t missed tackles a game. I told you, double digits missed tackles are the problem. And and I, I think it's going to be tough. It's kind of a weakness on weak, weakness matchup, right? Will Georgia be able to be explosive enough to exploit Arkansas's above average defense? Now, Arkansas's offense and Georgia's defense, this is a clash of the Titans. Sam Pittman has Arkansas's offense tough, running the football. They, uh, Kate, uh, they're, 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 playing exceptional, honestly. And Georgia's defense is the best defense in college football. They really are. Their, their corners, Keely Ringo, Darion Kendrick, are absolute studs. Darion Kendrick is a two-year starter at Clemson. They got through the, the portal. This week, apparently, they're going to have Ty, Tyke Smith back, or back, back from injury. He's never played at Georgia. He was an All-American at West Virginia. They also got through the portal. So I love this defense. They're number one in the country, 3.3 uh, yards per play, first scoring defense in the country, fifth rushing defense, second passing defense. They're studs. Number one red zone in defense. They haven't allowed a touchdown in the red zone yet. Absolute filth. Now, for perspective, the offenses they faced, Clemson, 121st in the country. UAB, 79th in the country. South Carolina, 116th in the country. Vanderbilt, 123rd in the country. So, I love Georgia's defense when you watch them on film, but they've played absolute dog shit offenses. So it's going to be an interesting mashup. I mean, Arkansas runs runs the ball more than anyone in the SEC. 188 rushing attempts. That is their mantra. Tough as shit, grinds you out, beats you down. Is this rush defense at Georgia the real deal? We're going to find out on Saturday. Honestly, I'm taking Arkansas plus 18 and a half. I think Sam Pittman plays this extremely close because the reality is this. Arkansas doesn't need to win this game. They don't need to beat Georgia right now even to make the playoffs. They need to win the SEC West. If they beat Bama and Ole Miss, they're in the championship game in Atlanta. And if they do that, they'll probably get a rematch against Georgia if they lose this game. And if they beat Georgia in the rematch, they're in the playoffs. So this is not a critical game for Arkansas. They need to keep it close for optics, but they don't need to win this game to do anything they want to do. This is... This is honestly a game where I think Sam Pittman keeps it close, maybe tries to win it at the end, controls the clock, controls the ball, and just pounds Georgia. And we'll see how this rushing defense is. Last game of the week, Lane Kiffin returns to try to spank his daddy, Nick Saban. Ole Miss is going back to Alabama. If you didn't see what's his, uh, Mike Wilbon, I think is his name from PTI, complete fucking clown. Clown show calling out Nick Saban or calling out Lane Kiffin. Mike Wilbon is a guy that went to Northwestern, learned how to talk well, doesn't know dick about football, college football, or sports in general. He just can speak and give some well thought out opinion because he went to Northwestern's broadcasting school. Complete clown. Now, Ole Miss, best offense in the country, right, on paper. They played Louisville, Austin P, and Tulane. But I'm going to tell you right now, Matt Corral is a baller. Rushing threat, almost five yards per carry, five touchdowns. He's a stud. 81% adjusted completion percentage. But honestly, Lane Kiffin's offense is the story here. Right, 751 of his 1,000 yards are on RPOs and play actions, meaning he only has 250 yards through three games on drop back passes. Nick Saban hates RPOs and hates tempo, and that is Lane Kiffin's baby. He is going to drive Saban wild, and I'm here for it. The other th crazy stat is Matt Corral has thrown 100 throws. Six of them are what are classified as big-time throws meaning that it was a tight window and he needed to make a pinpoint accurate throw. Six of 100 times, 
He needed to make a big time throw. The rest of the time, they were open, and he he didn't need to make a great throw. Here's how good, uh, or here's the question: Can Alabama create contested throws for Ole Miss? That's what they need to do, right? I love Dontario Drummond. I love Jonathan Mingo. I think they're studs. The uh, the Ole Miss defense with DJ Durkin. If you don't remember, DJ Durkin was a great was a coordinator at Florida, coordinator at Michigan, became the head coach at Maryland. Had a kid die, kind of went off into the shadows for a while. Now he's back as Lane Kiffin's D coordinator. I like their defense. Thirteen missed tackles per game is problematic. They run a three man front, which isn't great for the run game. But this Alabama offense is not dominant, right? Bryce Young has been he's picked it up as of late, right? Five for 18 on deep balls because he was three for five this weekend against a shit team, right? Nine of 11 over 10 yards this past weekend. But before that, he was 40% over 10 yards and 15% on deep balls. So I look, I looked as it, at this for a game where you're going to find out about Bryce Young. Is he, does he have the capabilities to win a championship? Does he? Because he hasn't looked like it to date. This, they're not loaded at offensive skill either. I like John Mechie. He's not the same as the four first-rounders that just walked out the door. I love Jamison Williams. I recruited him to Ohio State. He is a first-round talent who is exploding this year. 22 targets, 12 receptions. He is the real deal, and he is a home-run threat. Brian Robinson's coming back as their running back. He's a solid back. He's not Najee Harris. He's not any of these great Bama backs, but he's a solid back. I mean, Bama averaged 3.2 yards per carry against Florida. Tennessee ran for four yards a carry on Florida. And then they are averaged 3.8 yards a carry on Miami. Michigan State running for 4.7. So this is not some dominant rushing attack. It's just not, right? Ole Miss, like I said, plays a three-man front. Uh, 3.5 yards a carry average. Louisville averaged four yards a carry. So I think this is a weakness on weakest situ- weakness situation again. I do think Lane Kiffin causes uh, Alabama and Nick Saban problems, but Ole Miss has yet to be tested. Matt Corral is getting hyped as a Heisman front runner, but he hasn't had to make big time throws yet. He's just kind of a baller, right? He's had wide ass open receivers. I don't think Nick Saban lets that happen. Over under is at fucking 80. So wow. And last year, I think they scored what? 63 48. So whatever that is, 111 points. So over under set at 80. That's a big, big number. Um, this year's Alabama's defense is far worse than last year. So I'm taking the over and Ole Miss at plus 14 and a half. I don't think they can win it, but I think they put up points and cause a lot of problems and have people scratching their head at how good this Alabama team is. So that's my rundown for the weekend. Drop your predictions down below. Chance to win 100 bucks. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for listening. As always, I appreciate you. And we will see you next episode. Hit subscribe before you get out of here. Thanks.